Okay. So uh, you see my name up here, but this course wouldn't be possible without Roberto Garcia, who's done all the filming for this, and it has helped tremendously to put it together. And uh, you'll see his credits on the little movies that we'll see coming up. So um, you've probably heard nature abhors a vacuum, and that's true. It doesn't like it, and uh, uh, but we need it for what we want to do. And here's an outline. We're going to spend a little time on the fundamentals. Then we'll deal quite a bit of time, use a lot of time on the vacuum components to make you familiar with these items. If you're not, we'll have good vacuum practice and troubleshooting at the end. So the fundamentals and the vacuum practice will be live. The others will be pre-recorded. There'll be question and answer sessions at the end of each one. And you can ask your questions either in chat uh, um, or live and your answers can be live as well. My background is uh, 1973 started working with a vacuum system at Bell Labs uh, it was mostly diffusion pump. So um, the goal of this is to have you not mistake, make the same mistakes I have. So I've made them all already. Hopefully you won't have to. Why do we need a vacuum? Well, instrumentation we use, especially if you're in the analytical field, use ion and electron beams and they don't go too far in air. So we need a low pressure there. And many of you also probably work with vacuum systems for doing depth positions. And in that case, the gas in the chamber can oxidize or change what's in the, uh, the process you want or contaminate it. So lots of reasons to have a vacuum. Now I'm sure you're all familiar with the ideal gas law, which relates pressure, volume, and temperature, but maybe you're not as familiar with how fast these molecules move around. So if you take, uh, and we won't show the derivations and we'll show you some references at the end, but the, at, you know, let's say room temperature for nitrogen, it's 472 meters per second. Now I can't run that fast, but it just gives you an idea. These are zipping around inside your system. Another concept that's important is rate of arrival of molecules at a surface. And um, unfortunately, I don't see the slide numbers on my display. So hopefully you're, you're following along on your, uh, you're seeing the, sli the slides show up. But I'm also giving you an outline with the details. So if you get lost, you should be able to be able to pick it up fairly rapidly. The, uh, at, uh, so for silicon, a monolayer is 10 to the 15th atoms per centimeter squared. At room temperature for nitrogen and 10 to the minus six tor, if every atom that hit that surface stuck in two seconds, you would have a monolayer on it. So you have a sticking coefficient in play there but it just shows you that if you don't have a very good vacuum, you're gonna cover that surface and you won't necessarily be analyzing, the material be analyzing what's been deposited. Now, a very important concept is mean free path. Once again, we we'll, won't go through the derivation, but the idea is how far does the molecule go before it hits something? And you can come up with a really simple equation down at the bottom of that slide. So I work at NC State, so can we use a vacuum cleaner? Well, this vacuum cleaner is useful because it can remove unwanted items. But how does the vacuum cleaner work? Well, it's actually got a fan there and uh, we put a pressure measurement on this device and come up with 630 torr. Atmospheric pressure, you should know, is 760 torr. You calculate the mean free path, it's 79 nanometers. So it doesn't look like the vacuum cleaner will work for our system. However, if you look at some vacuum examples, you'll see, and uh, does this show, Roberto, the, uh, the, the uh, cursor? Good. So there's our vacuum cleaner, your rotary vane pump, your four pump, 10 to minus three tor, your mean free path's about 10 centimeters. Now you probably haven't seen a vacuum tube, but there your pressure is much lower. You're into kilometers. Our XPS system runs almost in the minus 11s. 
Now we're talking about hundreds of kilometers. And uh, for the people at Jefferson Lab, the best known vacuum in the world has been at CERN, 10 to the minus 13. So you're out there in space. So um, let's talk about the uh, difference between the gas flow regimes. And there are two types. One is viscous flow. That means it's above 10 minus degree tour. In viscous flow, most collisions occur between the molecules. Once you get below 10 minus three tor, there aren't as many atoms in that vacuum system. The molecules collide with the vacuum chamber components much more frequently than with each other. In that case, your gas flow is affected by your design of your vacuum system and not hitting the other molecules. So here's a schematic showing that your viscous flow, your momentum transfer is between the molecules. Molecular flow, your collisions are with the walls of the vacuum system. Here's something important to understand. So rough vacuum, this initial pump down, you're mostly pumping air, nitrogen and oxygen. Now we go to high vacuum, 10 to the minus three to 10 to the minus eight tor. Your gases are coming off from the surfaces usually. And what do we have? water. And we'll mention this more than once, but water is something we really don't want in a vacuum system. We'll explain more on that later. We go to ultra high vacuum, and this may be a surprise. What's in there? Hydrogen. So different pumps are needed to try and remove species like hydrogen, as opposed to water, nitrogen, and CO. Now, a couple of terms that you'll see, throughput, quantity of gas flowing through a vacuum system, tor liter per second. You won't see that that much. The one you will see is pumping speed. That's the point in a vacuum where you've got uh, the gas flowing through a plane at that point. That's in liters per second. That's how all of your pumps will be rated. Um, it may be in meters cubed per hour, but uh, you can convert to that. Now this gets into the design of your system. Conductance is how easily you can pump the gas out of a system. And you look at the, this uh, diagram, imagine you have a chamber and a pump. You've got three different tubes with conductance of one, 10, or 100 liters per second. Conductance is greater than that of the largest tube. Now let's put them in series the conductance is less than that of the smallest two. In your vacuum design, you really don't want to have constrictions or a lot of twists and turns if you can avoid it. It just makes it harder to pump out your system. A couple of other terms, physical absorption. Gases are close to the liquid state at the temperature of the surface. And it depends your coverage on the sticking coefficient. Now, if you drop the pressure, rise the temperature, increase temperature, then your absorption may be reduced. What's the problem with water? Water is a really sticky molecule. So whenever it absorbs from one spot, the next spot it hits, it sticks there. So water takes a long time to pump out of a system. That's why you backfill with nitrogen, you bake systems, you're trying to get the water out. It really takes a lot longer to pump out a system if you have moisture in it. And uh, for those of us living here in North Carolina, humidity is high, and especially this week, it's a little higher. Another term is chemisorption. Here we're going from a gas to a solid. This occurs with reactive gases, and you'll see this in some of the pumps where we use titanium, and fresh titanium likes to absorb and hold on to materials such as hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, etc. Safety is very important. Uh, you know, I tell my students that I can be hurt, but you can't. If I don't give you the information to, for you to do your job safely, that is not acceptable. You have to realize that when you have a system pumped out, you have a tremendous amount of pressure on it. 
14.7 pounds per square inch or 10 to the fifth newtons per meter squared. So if something's flexible, you have to support it like a bellows. And if you've got a piece of glass, you have a danger of implosion if you've got a viewing port. There's really pretty little risk on that because the materials used are very strong. You have a bigger risk here and that's from your gas cylinders. And in this course, we'll actually show you removing a regulator from a gas cylinder in a safe means. Your cryo pumps, your absorption pumps also have some risk um, because uh, the cryo pumps have a uh, like 300 PSI pressure in those lines. Reactive gases, so on at least one mass spectrometer I work with, if you press the wrong button, it would pump the oxygen cylinder that you're using for an oxygen source. If the, uh, this didn't happen to us, happened to someone else though, and that oil with all the oxygen on it started a fire. What's your real hazard? Electrical. You have sputter ion pumps and gauges, some of which have high voltages on all the time. If you're working with hazardous gases, you have to be careful with that. It must be vented in a safe fashion. And I mentioned the titanium, which when it's fresh is uh, reactive. Here's something you should have for every system, a log book. The record keeping is very useful because if you put things in there, like when I changed the oil or uh, when we you know, bought this particular piece here and is it out of warranty, it's very helpful to have that in one place. And it should include the base pressure and time to reach your base pressure. That's very useful when you're doing troubleshooting. So here's an example. This is actually taken from our Focus sign beam instrument. And you'll see at a particular point, this log is done on the computer. And your logbook can certainly be on a computer. This discontinuity actually meant that the gauge had failed. It had a defect in it. Here's a typical vacuum system. We've got some kind of four pump, a turbo pump probably, and a sample and reduction chamber. And we're gonna pump this down and now we're gonna put the samples into some area where we're doing analysis or deposition. We have different gauges, a thermocouple gauge on the four line, typically ion gauges or colcatho gauges up for these chambers, a gate valve to move samples. And this may be pumped with dry pumping, ion pumps or sublimators. And we'll cover all of those shortly. Here, for example, is a time of flight SIMS sample entry chamber. There's your gate valve, your, uh, your pump down chamber and your analysis chamber. There, the volume we're pumping is 3.5 liters or XPS five liters. But on a TEM, you put the sample in fairly quickly. Two reasons, one, you don't have that high a vacuum Number two, you're only pumping out something like 15 milliliters. So that can vary dramatically depending on the design of the instrument. Something you should be familiar with is a vacuum system diagram. And this is the one on our time of flight sims. And you'll see different symbols. This one is a ga uh, gauge. There's a turbo pump or a uh, symbol for a pump. That's a valve. And it's a map that shows you how the vacuum system's connected. You can look up on the line and look at all these different symbols. Uh, they're cute, it's a lot of fun to draw them. And the point is that you understand how your vacuum system is set up. This is one on a mass spectrometer, it's a live one, which means if I click on this, I open that valve. If I click on this, I turn off that turbo pump. And this particular one is set up to read the pressures as well. This is called a vacuum synoptic. If you don't have a diagram, here's one for a focused sign beam. There's the uh, ion column and electron column. If you don't have one, draw your own. And uh, this is the vacuum system we'll use for the course. And uh, you'll see this in video later. There's your turbo pump. There's a gate valve here. And uh, there's no separate intro system on this. You have this chamber, there's an ion pump, cold gatho gauge, and uh, controls for a turbo pump there. This is a drawing for that particular system. You can easily make your own in PowerPoint. Uh, it takes you know very little time to do it. 
but if you don't have a diagram, i really recommend you make one.